Hello, and thank you for joining us for our final webinar in this year's archive series, Life After War. I'm Noelle Wall. I'm the Director of Education here at the Congressional Medal of Honor Society, and I'm joined by Laura Jowdy, the Society's Director of Archives, Collections, and Museum. And we are here on board the USS Yorktown at Patriot Point in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, which is home to the Congressional Medal of Honor Society headquarters, as long as the museum, which is where we are here today. And we're going to talk a little bit about what happens after those heroic military actions of the Medal of Honor recipient. So during this series, we talked about a lot of different topics, and that's our kind of focus for today is what happens after those moments that most people know the Medal of Honor recipients for. You know, we often conflate the Medal of Honor recipients with that individual action. We read their citation or we watch a video about what they did on the battlefield, but the recipients are so much more than that. Their life is full and they have um, much that they've contributed to, to our society here at home. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Um, but for some of the recipients, and we've talked a little bit about this before in some of our past webinars, the Medal of Honor action is the final action. So a lot of those actions are, um, a lot of those medals are awarded posthumously, right? Right. About 18% of all medals of honor since the Civil War have been awarded posthumously. The number is a little bit higher if you just consider the modern era, but about 18% have been awarded posthumously. Yeah, but for many others, that moment is, is just that it's a moment, it happens and it's gone, and then life moves on. Um, and it's something that helps define who they are, that, that action, that medal of honor action, but it's not all of who they are. Right. And that's one of the things we try to focus on here in our archives and our museum is not only that moment in time, but the whole person, um, who they were both before and after service. Um, of course, if they survived their action or their time in service. Um, and it, it's really about capturing the whole per the person's whole story, um, in addition to, of course, the, you know, that key moment in time. Right. And so we're excited to talk a little bit more about that today. But before we get started, for those of you who are joining us live, there is a question and answer box on the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to type in any questions. We'll look at those as they come in and we'll take some time at the end of the webinar to answer them. If there are some that we're not able to answer during the time of the webinar, we will give a, we will try as much as possible to follow up with you after the webinar to get you any answers that we're not able to deliver live today. Absolutely. Um, and we are gonna be talking about a number of recipients during our conversation, as well as some other resources. And so if you're joining live, you can check out the chat box and there'll be some links that will go in there to the recipient pages on our website and to some additional resource pages that you can use, as well as if you're joining uh, the recording. So if you're watching this uh, as a recording, if you look at the description below, it'll have links out to all of those same pages so that you're able to gather a little bit more information about the recipients that we're going to be kind of touching on today and whose objects we're gonna be focusing on. So I think that's all of the housekeeping before we get started on the good stuff. So I'm excited to look at these items today that we've pulled out for everyone to uh, to explore. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and I'm thrilled to be able to share it with people. We've got some items here that are a little bit different um, than you would normally expect to see in a military archive, but it, it'll be great being able to share them with the audience. Yeah, it'd be nice to round it out to end out the, the series this year. Exactly. So life after war is the theme today, and the recipients took a lot of divergent paths after their Medal of Honor actions, one option was to stay in service. Right. And there are a number of recipients who did choose to maintain that military path after their Medal of Honor actions. Right, and there are a number who, you mean the Medal of Honor action could happen anywhere within their career. So some, you know, they were drafted and went in and it was their first enlistment, their first time, you know, being deployed in a combat zone and their Medal of Honor action happened. Um, some of them had been almost military careerists before they had their action, and then they continued service afterwards, or some of them, they were on the tail end of their careers and retired afterwards. Right. So, And, some, and uh, something that I get questions about a lot when people are looking at our website is sometimes there are multiple ranks on someone's page. Yes. So maybe their action was one rank, and then their citation was different. I, yeah, it's um, some of them, you know, they're privates at the time of their action, and they've been promoted to corporal by the time the medal's presented, and then maybe they retire as a captain. I mean, some went to OCS, officer candidate school, you know, in between there, and so if you look at their particular pages, you might see as many as three different ranks listed, and it'll be, you know, the rank at time of action, rank at presentation, and rank, you know, final rank. So, I mean, you could 
and we try to be as accurate as possible and reflect that on our website and provide that information and try to be as clear as possible because it can get confusing. Right. And so receiving the Medal of Honor in the military is a huge deal, it is. especially in our modern era. So what does life look like to be in the military as a Medal of Honor recipient? That has to be a unique challenge. Um, yes. And I can only share, you know, anecdotes I've heard. Um, I've heard that it can be incredibly difficult because you have this medal that maybe your superior doesn't have, and there's a lot of pressure put on you. You have to try a little bit harder or do a little bit more because the expectations already set high because you have that medal. Um, some of the guys I've heard, you know, had particularly a hard time because maybe the person above them was maybe a little bit jealous that they had the medal owner. Um, and mind you, these are all just various perspectives I've heard over the years working with these gentlemen. Um, and then, you know, for others, I mean, it can to totally change your trajectory. I mean, let's say you sign up to be a soldier and to fight and you get the Medal of Honor and all of a sudden you're pulled back for a bond campaign, you know, and all of a sudden you're in ads and giving speeches and trying to raise money. And it's not at all what you signed up for, but it's what you've been pulled to and tasked with doing because you are now a nation, nationwide hero. You know, it's a totally different aspect of what you thought you'd be doing. Right. Going from being a grunt to being a person on a pedestal is quite the transition. Exactly. And it happens overnight. Right. And there's uh, there's a mechanism within the armed services to prepare Medal of Honor recipients to take on those responsibilities, but how can you really prepare for that? Right, and I mean, there is now, I have a feeling during World War II, they didn't really have that in place, but now they do have, you know, um, for lack of a better word, a, a handler, somebody who's going to help right. teach them, you know, how to do interviews and to transition into this role. Right. So that's really very helpful. I think it's helped a lot of the, especially the war on terror recipients. Right, especially for people who whose passion is combat, whose passion exactly. is helping people and being in the field and then to be um, not in that role, right? Big, big challenge. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we do have a couple of objects that we're going to look at today of people who did stay in the service. So what do we right. have for, um, that, for that topic? <laughs> for the first one, um, we have this briefcase. Um, and it was, it, it belonged to Donald Gary. He was a World War II recipient. And this is a piece, he retired in 1950. So World War II, 1950, he retires from the Navy. So this is his briefcase, and you can see here it has Medal of Honor um, Society on it. Um, and Lakeland was one of the places where we had um, a society convention at one point. So obviously this is something he took with him to the convention, and he has a label on it. So it's really just a plain black briefcase, but it does represent kind of his life um, and what he did with it. I mean, I love pieces of luggage anyway, but this one's really interesting just because it did belong to him, and it's representative of you know, PC obviously took with him when he traveled. Right, right. So, and then we've also got um, these boots. And these belong to a Medal of Honor recipient named Robert Patterson. And he received his Medal of Honor for action in Vietnam. And these boots are boots he wore during Desert Storm in the 90s. So he stayed in as well. And he actually retired as a Master Sergeant. So these are boots he wore, and you can see the wear on them. And I've mentioned this in previous um, webinars we've done is a lot of times people see these old objects and they think, oh, I need to fix that up. It looks so awful. Uh, yeah, no, not really. Part of the wear and tear on these objects is their story. So when you go and you say you have to shine up this black and make it, make it brand new, you've then erased the story that the piece is telling you. So to keep it unique and keep it um, with the history on it, I think is really important because you can see he did indeed wear these boots. They um, were worn in a combat zone and you know, I mean, this is part of the story of the object and the recipient story as well. Right. Well, and it helps span the history as well. It right. helps us see, you know, for a conflict like Desert Storm, where we don't have uh, recipient actions that we would have artifacts for to say a recipient was there, you mm -hmm. know, it helps us kind of get the, the bigger picture of history. Exactly. Exactly. And the, sort of the last piece I want to talk about in this was a recipient named Alexander Peters, and he was an immigrant from Russia. And he, he earned the Medal of Honor during what we call either a peacetime or an interim period um, in the late 1900, 1800s. And usually those were for life-saving missions or you know, doing something particularly spectacular when a ship was caught in a storm and so that sort of thing. But I wanted to share this with you because he received his medal, like I said, at the end of the 1800s, but he stayed in until the 1920s. So this year, is a letter just acknowledging his service 
Um, and, you know, I, this was part of his pension paperwork, you know, they're his qualifying saying, yes, you did serve as long as you said you did. And so this was all part of his pension process. And another piece of his, which actually predates his Medal of Honor reaction, but I really wanted to share it with everybody today. Um, this is, he applied to be a United States citizen in 1899. So this is his certificate of um, citizenship. And you see on there, he's renouncing allegiances to Russia's czar. And he um, is becoming a United States citizen. So you see district court at the top, dates. And I love this because it's indicative of somebody who came to this country and chose to become a citizen. So that's why we brought it out today. That's really interesting. Yeah, and so we, we have these, these objects here that talk about the journey of a Medal of Honor recipient who comes back home, but mm -hmm. remains in the service and maybe right. gets deployed again, who continues to live the a life in the military. Yes. Um, a lot of the recipients chose or weren't able to choose because they were medically discharged or weren't able to serve anymore um, to return to a more civilian life. Right. So we're going to talk about a few of those as well. Right. Um, the first one. Civil War. Yes, we're going to start yeah. with the Civil War. Uh, and, you know, during the Civil War, something like 2.8 million uh, men and a few women um, served um, both Union and Confederate. So that's a number for both sides. But the United States. Um, you know, population was only about 31 million at the time. So that's roughly 8% of the population actually ended up fighting. Um, that's not, of course, people who were in auxiliary roles or, you know, the non-military people who followed behind the camp, like maybe some cooks and some wives followed their husbands as well. So there was a pretty big participation rate. Now, this piece I really like because it's this is an invention by a recipient named Walter Thorne, um, and he was an attorney in New York City. And so this is an invention he came up with. This is a, he called it a life belt for boats. So you can see the boat here, and it's basically an airbag on the side of the boat um, to prevent, you know, other boats running into it. Maybe they come up with a lot of flotsam in the water. Um, so he's got, he came up with this and had it sketched out for himself. So he could submit it to the patent office. And I just love this because here's a guy who's an attorney who's doing inventing on the side. So it's kind of just telling his story in a different way about how, you know, yes, I'm an attorney and day to day I might, you know, be writing legal briefs, but at night I am imagining other ways and other, you know, ways we can make life better for others. Wow. So I really love that. And in the meanwhile, he was also one of the heads of one of our precursor, precursor in groups called um, the Medal of Honor Legion. And he was the president of that. So, okay. yeah. So coming back from war in the Civil War and exactly. deciding to be an attorney and an inventor, that's yes. quite quite a life. Um, and then we have another, we have a campaign ribbon as well from, exactly. uh, from the Civil War. Yes, this is um, <laughs> um, a campaign ribbon for Senator Matthew S. Quay. And I love this campaign ribbon because the ones today you see are mostly buttons. Some of them have a ribbon attached to them, but this one in particular has an actual photograph attached to it. And he's running here for state chairman and that's um, for Pennsylvania. He was the Senator from Pennsylvania. He served in the Pennsylvania legislator. He was a state um, treasurer. He had a long political career after um, his service during the civil war. So I love this piece. It's a little bit worn at the bottom, but other than that, it's in great condition and it's just, a great piece of history. So here on the back, that's the maker's mark, um, made in Philadelphia, of course, 1880. So this is a great piece you can see that just went down in your jacket. So no safety pin here. This is <laughs> where it's your own risk ribbon. And we know a lot about, or we think in our society, a lot about what life was like for returning veterans in Vietnam or in our you know modern wars, but a returning veteran in the civil war, that's as you mentioned, a huge mm -hmm. chunk of the population, first of all, were returning exactly. veterans from the Civil War, mm -hmm. but also, you know, they saw a lot of atrocities, but they were the the people who had to carry on all of society mm -hmm. almost completely. So you see a lot of politicians. Right, right. We had a lot of recipients who did become politicians, all the way from governor. Obviously, Teddy Roosevelt became president. Um, we had ones who ran for president um, who didn't win. Um, we've got, you know, Taylor, baker, farmer, <laughs> factory worker, entrepreneur, teacher. 
um, everything under the sun, really, um, mail carriers. Yeah. Um, and we have something from Frank Upton, right? From World yeah. War One. Yes. And he is someone, he received his medal from World War One. Um, he jumped overboard into, there was a ship that had a, an incident and there were powder boxes in the water. And as a result of the incident, a lot of the powder boxes were on fire and exploding. So he jumped in the water to save um, a, a couple men's lives to pull them out. And so after the war, he joined the Merchant Marine and he was in the Merchant Marine for a couple decades and all the way through World War II actually. Um, but right after, in the early 1920s, he was on the Merchant Marine vessel and they came upon a British vessel that was in distress from a storm. So they're out in this storm, trying to not only save the vessel, but to save the lives of the people on that vessel. And so he was in command of one of the small boats that went over to try to help the distressed vessel. And because it was a British ship, um, he, both Frank Upton, right, Frank Upton and um, some of the other men on the Merchant Marine vessel ended up receiving quite a few awards about it because a lot of people were really, you know, invested in this story. It was a big national, international story. And so that not only did they get a ticker tape parade down Broadway in New York City, um, they got a number of awards from humanitarian organizations. And the one I want to share with you today is actually, this is called a George V medal. It's extremely rare. They aren't handed out very often. Um, it's pretty hefty. It's solid gold. So you see King George of Britain on there. And his name, I don't know if you guys can see this because it's very tiny, but his Frank Upton's name is inscribed on the rim here. So this is the medal that was presented to him by the British government. And it's an award that is given for those who help save British um, subjects who are in trouble and peril. So this is a very rare award. And so we're very privileged to have that here. Interesting. So we've seen um, people who go into attorney, inventor, yeah. politician, saving folks' lives as a, as a merchant marine. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned already, we have a lot of folks who took on more mundane responsibilities mm -hmm. who really kind of came back and settled back into life and right. became things like chauffeurs. I know. And that's our next guy here. Um, this is um, William Thordson. Um, he was another immigrant and he came to the U.S., um, served in the military, received the Medal of Honor. And these are his chauffeur license for New York City. Um, so you see Bronx, New York here. There's a photo of him, his signature. He got his specs there. And this permitted him to um, be a chauffeur or a taxi driver in the city. So we've got him here in the Bronx still. And these go all the way, I believe, 1921, all the way to 1938. So it's kind of fun. You can see not only his weight change, but you can see him going to, um, you know, he says brown hair here, but I believe by the last one, he's down to having gray hair. Uh, but it's, it's fascinating. So for many years, he drove a taxi and it, it was, you know, whoever his people were, his passengers probably had no idea they had a Medal of Honor recipient driving in the, around the city. So and very different. Um, that, that level of anonymity is very different than what, um, some of these other recipients we've discussed who exactly. were much more, like I said, in the spotlight or right. um, kind of reliving their actions. But exactly. for some, settling back in and, and not having to relive that is the ideal. Right. And we have stories from some recipients' children who they said, I never even knew my dad had the Medal of Honor. I had no idea until I was like, I think the one son told me he was in his teens before he even found out. I mean, they kind of knew he had these medals, but they didn't know what they were. They didn't know the significance because dad never talked about it. Um, so, I mean, some of it was, they just drifted back into, into you know, living their lives. And, yeah. um, and one of the guys here, this is um, Robert Maxwell, and he actually became an educator. Um, he taught auto mechanics um, for many, many years up in Oregon. So this is him in his workshop um, teaching some students. And we had a number of recipients who ended up in, a, in the field of education. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Gary Bykirk, who passed recently, he was a guidance counselor for many, many years up in Rochester, New York, for example. And we talked about this on some of our other webinars, including outside of the series, in, uh, in some of our other series about veterans, but the skills that you gain in the military, you know, you don't necessarily think about teaching being something that a soldier, sailor, airman, marine would be naturally inclined to do, but it is 
really built into the military lifestyle, that mentorship, that understanding how to explain something to someone. Exactly. And it's, um, it's these kind of, I always like to think of them almost as soft skills, just the being able to work with different types of people um, effectively and, you know, mentorship, leadership, um, even just to be able to work out logistics in your head easy. I mean, and working under pressure, of course, is right. something that you learn in the military very quickly, of especially course. if you're in a combat zone. So we've there's a lot of skills transferable, you know, to the, if you will, real world <laughs> after you get out of the military. Right. And that that transfer back to real life, it is challenging, as we've already discussed mm -hmm. here today. And as anyone who knows our veterans understands that there are you know, a number of challenges, one of those being that you go from spending every second of the day with people who completely understand you and you have this camaraderie on the battlefield, and then you come back home to your family, um, to your community, and you might not have that. And so we have a number of recipients who really dedicated themselves to helping create that community post-military life. So I think we have some objects of people who um, helped in that way after they returned home. Right. And one of them that we're going to talk about is Francis Bishop from um, the Civil War. And what, because like, as we talked about, so many people were involved in the Civil War. Um, there was the Grand Army of the Republic, which was for Union veterans, regardless of if they had the Medal of Honor or not. And so they would have, you know, conventions where they'd get together and have that camaraderie again and experience it again and support each other and network. And so one of the pieces here, this is Francis, Francis Bishops um, from one of his, one of those conventions. So you see here, Company C, 57, Pennsylvania. Um, this is a badge that he would have worn during the convention to identify himself as to what unit he was in. And there was also, of course, membership badges you wear. If you look at the old photos of these conventions, the gentlemen sometimes are wearing four or five different badges. And it's just, you know, when you have that many people at a convention, being able to easily identify um, the other people who you serve with or you might have an identity connection with um, is important. Right, absolutely. So, and then we talked about how Walter Thorne was part of the Medal of Honor Legion. Um, eventually that became the Army and Navy Legion of Valor, which still exists today. So this is Francis Bishop. Now, mind you, he was Civil War as well. He lived a very long life. Mm -hmm. This is from 1930 and their convention um, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So again, we were talking about, you know, you'd wear things to identify yourself. Well, this is just a convention commemorative medal um, from July, 1930. So you've got, you know, the Harrisburg Capitol on there. Um, 40th annual reunion, the back of it, somebody's put some Velcro on there. <laughs> but, you know, this is just, again, another example of that camaraderie. Um, and then we've got one more piece here. This is, um, this is Edward Walker, and this is a Medal of Honor Legion um, medal as well. And you'll notice it actually has the Medal of Honor ribbon here on it. It's got his, the stars. And a few more pieces here. So again, it's all about, you know, the camaraderie and networking and meeting up with people who maybe, you know, understand a bit more of what you went through. And it was kind of during this time that we saw the very beginnings of what we now know as the Congressional Medal of Honor Society. Right, right, exactly. Um, the Medal of Honor Society was founded in 1950. Well, it started in the 40s after World War II. Um, but we received a congressional charter um, signed by President Eisenhower in 1958. So the other couple other things I'm going to show you are actually Medal of Honor Society um, items. So we've got a membership card. These belong to Herbert Schoenland. And we've got a membership card of his. And then every year we have a convention. So this is the one from Los Angeles in 1966. This is his name tag. Um, the pen part's broken off, but this is his name tag from that convention. And then also from that convention, um, they went to Disneyland and they actually shut down Disneyland to let about 300 Medal of Honor recipients and their families um, go through Disneyland. So this is the program from the day. And it's really kind of interesting. Um, this is rumored to be the last day that Walt Disney ever spent at the park. He went over and greeted the recipients and then supposedly went into the hospital later that day and passed away pretty quickly after that. So it's kind of a banner day. Um, I know the recipients certainly enjoyed it. 
One of the other things the recipients are invited to is the presidential inauguration. Um, this is from 1969. And this is from a gala at that convention. So here you've got, you know, Richard Nixon, Spiro Agnew. Um, and the, you'll see there's a lot of really big names there that performed at that gala that year. So it's kind of fun that the recipients get to go do this. Um, it's an honor for them to be included. And, you know, it's just part of what the society does as far as bringing the recipients together, not only for events, but for outreach. Um, we've got a lot of programs we do through the society that the recipients participate in. The society is made up, our membership is only Medal of Honor recipients. So everything we do is dictated by what their heart says we should be doing. So we've got like the character development program, which Noel oversees. Um, we've got outreach programs to businesses and schools and the recipients are very busy people. They're all over the country all the time. So yeah, even things like the convention have evolved so much. Exactly. You know, the camaraderie is a really a big cornerstone of the society, mm -hmm. the getting the recipients together, having them have that time and space to reflect on what they've experienced, to just spend time together as many military organizations do. It's a, it's a huge focus for our veterans um, to have that, to have that time and space mm -hmm. to um, reflect and have conversation. But the, the other really important piece of the conventions and of the society in general are the programs that you're talking about and how we can make the stories of the recipients something that's valuable to the society. And this is something that they live through, but we want you know, society at large to understand the, the bigger implications of those stories. And to be inspired by them. Absolutely, yes. And you know, we've spent time talking about, uh, in this series, the heroic actions. We've mm -hmm. talked about the sacrifice and the, the commitment that they showed. Um, and it's really important for us to kind of ground and end this series to talk about the legacy. Mm -hmm. Here at the Congressional Medal of Honor Society, our tagline is honor the sacrifice, inspire the future. And we've talked a lot in this series about honoring that sacrifice. And we just want to spend a few minutes talking about the, the future and the legacy of the recipients. Obviously, having their stories told is important, but helping the next generation to understand why they did what they did is just as essential mm -hmm. to um, making sure that they feel that they've left a mark yeah. on, the, on the world, on their communities, on their families. Um, so we have a few objects that we're going to talk about today um, about how the recipients are remembered. and. Um, how the public chooses to uh, immortalize them in, in different kinds of ways. So what do, we, what do we have to talk about first? I think we have the certificate, right? Curry. Oh, yeah, this is um, World War II, Francis Curry. Um, he was involved in the Battle of the Bulge um, and it put him in a town in Belgium called Malmedy. Well, a number of years later, I believe in the 1990s, he traveled back to that town. And this is a hand-drawn certificate the citizens gave him um, at that time of appreciation. You've got the town seal down here, actually in wax. Um, and he would, Frank Curry would talk about how this was such an important visit for him to go back and see this town and meet, in some cases, the grandchildren of the people that he helped save and liberate from the Nazis. So this is, you know, indicative of something that he did. He did this outreach to go visit the town and the town remembered him. Um, as a local hero. So this is something they gave him, you know, as a, as a memory of that visit. And one of the things we talk about with the legacy of the recipients is that kind of pebble in upon ripple effect. The fact right. that you do this one action and then it can have implications for years. Right. And I mean, one of the most touching examples I've heard of is, um, remember we talked about Robert Maxwell and he, the superior officer he saved during his Medal of Honor action later named his son after Robert Maxwell. So there's kind of these touching stories you hear um, both direct and indirect of the impact they've had. Sometimes the person they save, you know, uses them as, let's say it's a posthumous Medal of Honor award. That person becomes, you know, inspires the person they saved to maybe live a better life or to give back to the community or society. So you do have that ripple effect, whether they continue to live on or they pass away after their action. Right. And in some cases, we're incredibly lucky to have a physical artifact to mm -hmm. show how people showed their appreciation and how that person continued to impact. And in other cases, it's oral histories. It's just right. um, like what you just told, sharing that story and venues like this so that we can make sure that people understand that that 
that impact and how it continues. Right. And then we have a jacket here. Yes, right? um, out of your way. this jacket over here. Um, it's an American Legion post in South Dakota, and they've chosen to name um, their post after Woodrow Keeble. He received the Medal of Honor as an upgrade not too long ago. And, you know, this is just an example of, you know, a lot of these veteran posts are named for Medal of Honor recipients. Um, they just sort of become, this is maybe not the right word, but the mascot, the inspiration for the post. And in this case, they chose um, Master Sergeant Keeble. And that, that idea of naming uh, a place, a building, something like that after a recipient, it's definitely common. We also have some ships. Yes, we have. The Navy has named over 250 ships after Medal of Honor recipients. And so I've got two um, commissioning programs here, one for the USS DeWert, and that was in 1983, and the Ralph Johnson um, program. And that was just recently here in Charleston Harbor. And I was privileged to be able to go and go to the commissioning ceremony for that ship. And it was very touching. Um, his sister got up and spoke about him. Of course, there were dignitaries. Um, the crew ran up on the deck and it was just a very, ex very nice ceremony. And the ship, of course, is named for him and he's immortalized in that as is Richard DeWert um, from World War II. Interesting. And we have a civilian. Yes, uh, and we have a civilian well. vessel. Um, the life ring up here. Um, is named for a Vietnam recipient, Stephen Pless. Um, and he actually survived his Medal of Honor action, but then came back to the States and tragically died in a motor motorcycle accident down in Florida, not too much later. So this life ring is actually from a ferry that ran in New York City called the SS um, Stephen Pless. And this ferry was decommissioned. There's not a ferry running around without a life ring right now. Mm -hmm. um, but the family, his cousins donated this to us. So it could be immortalized as well. Interesting. And we do have a couple of uh, more, I guess you would call them fun, immortalization strategies. Yes. yes. Right here. Um, right here. Um, in the 90s, I believe it went into the early 2000s. Um, they made GI Joes <laughs> that are based off of Medal of Honor recipients and their actions. This one in particular, um, is Mitchell Page. So you see here a picture of him, an artist rendering with his machine gun. And so then on the inside, they modeled the face after Mitchell Page and they gave him the weaponry he used in his Medal of Honor action. And there you see a little tiny Medal of Honor um, for the G.I. Joe. Um, I, I love these pieces. And I know there, there's one for Frank Curry as well. Um, I believe Roy Benavidez, uh, MacArthur. So there's a number of them, um, but these are pieces, obviously this one's still in the box, they are collector items, but it's really quite an honor to be immortalized as a GI Joe, I think. Right. Um, another option that we're seeing now, um, starting around World War II, a gentleman named Arthur Curtis started doing syndicated comics um, about Medal of Honor recipients and their actions. Um, they are not politically correct. There's a lot of um, terms in here that we no longer use, but you'll see they're drawn like this, but some of our older viewers might remember these because they were syndicated across the country. And this was um, his kind of, Arthur Curtis was the driving force behind it. You'll see here, Michael Aarons was the artist, but he was, the, he was a driving force between getting these out. And it's just another way to share the stories. And in the last few years, it's kind of exciting that um, the Association of the United States Army has started doing new comics. And so this one here, this is a compendium of them, um, volume three, Jacob Parrott, Donovan, Red Cloud, and Donlin. You can go to their website. We'll post a link to it. These are free for reading. Um, they're beautifully drawn, well-researched, and it's just telling their stories in another way and another format that's very approachable, especially for young children. Um, well, maybe not horribly young, but because <laughs> the subject matter, school age, yeah, the school age people. kids, but I mean, it certainly is an excellent way to share their stories in a, in a different you know, format. Absolutely. And we see a lot of Medal of Honor recipients in the media as well, in terms of movies, TV, and that, that started 100 plus years ago. Yeah, <laughs> it did um, actually all the way to um, World War I. They're the Lost Battalion, um, Georgia McMurtry and um, Whittlesley, Charles Whittlesley, um, actually went back and re 
acted their experience during the Lost Battalion for a movie. Um, it's actually them in the movie back in the forest and performing their parts. So there was that. And then um, in World War II, of course, to hell and back with Audie Murphy. Um, there have been just, in, in recent years, there's been a lot. The movie Devotion just came out, which recounts um, Thomas Hudner's uh, Medal of Honor action. So really, Hollywood, these stories are so inspirational and so dramatic. They really lend themselves to being told on the big screen. Absolutely. And to kind of circle back to what we talked about before, mm -hmm. a lot of those media, the films, the even these comic books, they, they're focusing on the story of the action, which is True. essential to understanding the recipient why they um, are remembered, right. but it is such a small part of their life. It is. And that is um, at the society and as through the archives and through the work that we do with students, it's important to help paint the bigger picture and tell the bigger story because right. a lot of these recipients, they came home to a family. Their legacy is their Medal of Honor action, but it might also be their children. It might also right. be the community board that they served on right. or the school that they volunteered in. And there, there are so many kind of ways to show how much they contributed to society beyond that moment in time. Right. And so, I mean, that's one of the things we try to preserve here is not only the action, which is many times very well documented, actually by necessity, it needs to be to receive the Medal of Honor. There's a lot of documentation that goes into it. But it's also, you know, who they were before, who they were after, who they were as people. And that's something we try to collect and tell here and preserve. Yeah. And when, when the recipients are no longer with us, helping to have society in general remember who they are. Right. Right. I mean, we just had a recipient pass yesterday, um, Hiroshi Miyamura. Um, he went by Hershey. Um, but, you know, he came home after the war and he would go to the inaugurations and the society events and all that. But in the meanwhile, he worked as a postal carrier in Gallup, New Mexico. So he was, you know, he was well known in the community and his impact there was pretty great. Um, he's a local hero there. Um, so, you know, I mean, sometimes the impact isn't so much, I gave a lot of speeches and I was in front of cameras, but the impact's a lot quieter, um, but is there nonetheless. Yeah, and we're happy to be able to play a small part in helping exactly. um, keep their legacy alive and help make sure that their their full story exactly. gets to be told and gets to be remembered by generations beyond ours. Right, and that's um, in some cases even more inspirational to my mind is not only did they do something so significant that they received the Medal of Honor for it, but they you know their whole lives sometimes can be so impactful. Right, absolutely. Well, and I think we have... Um, just a couple more minutes. I don't see any questions that have come in that we haven't already had a chance to answer. However, um, you can always reach us on our website. If you do think of a question or if you're watching this as a recording and want to submit a question, um, you can send us an email or submit a question through our portals on our website. And you can find all of the information about the recipients who we talked about today, as I said, either in the chat or in the description of this webinar, if you're watching it as a recording. We do encourage you to go on the website and find um, our past webinars and look for future opportunities to engage with us on, on other webinars, on other virtual events or exactly. in-person events, other opportunities as they come available. Or just drop us a note and email. Yeah, just drop <laughs> us an email. Um, we'd love to hear more about what you wanna see. So if you wanna tell us um, what topics you would like covered in future webinars, please let us know. You know we'd be happy to uh, make these as useful for the viewers as possible. Exactly. Uh, here at the Society, we are grateful to our donors who help make the work that we do possible. The Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation, the Bruce McCall Family Foundation, Delta Airlines, American Airlines, Fisher House, and so many more. We are a nonprofit and we rely completely on donations. We don't receive any government funding. So all of the work that we do here is supported by those donations. If you found value in these webinars and in the work that Laura does, the work that we do at the Society, um, we would encourage you to consider giving to help make this able to continue right. so that we're able to um, continue to preserve the legacy, continue to share it with people like you and uh, students and audiences across the country. Right. And our, our website has a donate button. Yep. <laughs> so we um, make it easy. <laughs> yep. So again, we're very grateful for you spending the time with us, learning more about the history of the medal, the history of the recipients, the history of the society. And we hope that you will join us again for a future webinar and that you'll engage with our material, watch our videos, learn more about the recipients and the important role that they've played in building the society 
um, that we have today. Oh, thank you for joining us. Thank you.